us. Our guest today is Gary Trudeau, the Pulitzer Prize-winning comic, uh, the com co creator of the comic strip Doonesbury, which appears in well over a thousand newspapers. Um, can you talk about that? What, the music we the just music heard we and just the Broadway heard, musical uh, was from a uh, Broadway musical called Doonesbury. And uh, that was a, a, a song that was sung by uh, the reporter Roland Burton Headley Jr. in the second act, and I haven't heard it in years. <laughs> uh, obviously, it's always a good time to be rich, um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you dug that one out. So I wanted to go back in your history, Gary, since you don't come out and talk to the world very much except through your comic strip, Doonesbury. Um, your grandfather ran a tuberculosis sanatorium upstate? My great-grandfather, and he opened the first um, sanatorium in North America for the, for the treatment of tuberculosis. And um, that has been the tradition of my family for three generations. It's and, so interesting, because yeah. my grandmother um, went to a tuberculosis sanatorium um, when she was, like, 50. She got TB and um, meningitis and different. And she went to one of these places. And I wonder if it was, if it was his. Uh, they didn't know if she'd last the year, and she lived till she was 108. <laughs> it, it was helpful for some people. I mean, there, there, there weren't any antibiotics in those days. And that's what eventually shut down the sanatorium. But what his insight was um, it, it remains important. It was about a, a holistic approach to health. And um, he was very, very committed to creating the conditions by which the body and the immune system um, can optimize its own recovery processes. So there was fresh air, there was, you know, good hygiene, healthy food, occupational therapy, all these things that were a little ahead of their time. Um, and uh, have, have been Im important in, in, in treating all kinds of disease. And how did that influence you? Well, I grew up kind of in awe of my own heritage, as did my father and his father, uh, because uh, Edward Trudeau, the, my great-grandfather, was, was a great man in his day. It was, uh, tuberculosis um, uh, was the number one killer, and he was well-known around the world. So, yeah, you grow up in a shadow in my little town, um, uh, a very big shadow. And it, I, I never felt any pressure to go into medicine. Um, uh, and once I'd, once I'd left and, and, and went to college, College and it was offered a, an alternative uh, uh, employment uh, that I really loved, um, I never looked back. And your family was involved with politics in New York? No, my my mother was a volunteer for Eisenhower. Back further. Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up in a, in a moderate Republican household, a Rockefeller Republican household. And my best friend, uh, who lived next door, his father was the publisher of the local paper and was a Democrat and eventually became an ambassador. Um, and uh, we rather regarded politics as one might regard the difference between the Dodgers and the Yankees being New Yorkers. Um, it was a, a, a friendly rivalry. It wasn't something that drove families apart and tore communities apart. And so their feelings about you becoming a comic strip? Who's fa who's fa your family's feelings about you? Um, they're 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 fine with it. I think you know my father worried for some years that there wouldn't be a living in it, and um, he just waited for me to to pivot into a career that seemed more stable to him. Um, I did go to graduate school in graphic design, and I did set up a, a, a graphic studio where I was I was doing that work in addition to the strip. But eventually, I had to pick between the two. I wanted to go to a quote of yours um, a few years ago. <clears throat> you said, traditionally, satire has comforted the afflicted while afflicting the comfortable. Satire punches up against authorities of all kinds, the little guy against the powerful. Ridiculing the non-privileged is almost never funny. It's just mean. By punching downward, by attacking a powerless, disenfranchised minority with crude, vulgar drawings closer to graffiti than cartoons, Charlie wandered into the realm of hate speech. You were talking about Charlie Hebdo, the right. magazine in Paris, right. the, and the 
<clears throat> this after the attack that took place that killed a number of the cartoonists. Explain what you were saying. It did, and that was very controversial at, at the time, to my great surprise. It didn't seem like I was saying anything particularly controversial. But feelings were still raw. This was only a few months after the after the killings. And although I had honored the cartoonists um, in the strip by name and, and including their drawings in a Sunday section, I nonetheless um, uh, disagreed with with what you know what they were trying to do with their art. I just simply wouldn't have done it. Life is full of editing decisions. You can't go through a day without making a dozen decisions not to do something. Editors do that with newspapers. We do it in relationships. It's just something I wouldn't do, and most cartoonists in, in this country wouldn't do. You don't do it just because you can. We all understand that you can. Um, that's we, we, we all get the First Amendment, but um, each person has to decide for themselves when you cross a line. <clears throat> so, let's go back to um, huge 30 years of Doonesbury on Trump and talk about why the title huge. Well, hopefully that's self-explanatory. The, the practical uh, reason for it was, was that um, there's only four letters, so you can make them very big on a cover. And um, that seemed to be not just a metaphor, but also helpful in terms of, of uh, people spotting it in a bookstore. Um, I'm going to go to one of the cartoon strips um, where um, you uh, have your character on the radio. He's in, he's out, he's keeping his options open. He may be hard to pin down, but one thing remains the same, a deep pathological need for attention. As far back as 1987, he's pretended to run for president, freshening his tacky brand with free media, but always wimping out before the first primary. So here he is, the man with the piggy eyes, contemptuous scowl, and hair like orange cotton candy. Welcome, sir. You didn't say my name, you freaking pinhead. Sorry, sir, I'm blanking on it. How embarrassing. It's, oh, we're out of time. Uh, our thanks to the caller. <laughs> it's almost like I was baiting him, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it was a pretty um, obvious uh, cartoon to kind of wander into just in terms of, of he was right on the precipice, and, and I was uh, just as uncertain as anyone else that he would actually go for it. And now I want to um, go to the cartoon that you're going to read. This is Hello. April 17th, 2016. You show Trump talking to a group of middle schoolers, saying, hey, kids, tired of getting killed on insults in the cafeteria? Then start fighting back with my quality Trump brand insults. Choose from over 500 tremendous insults I've tweeted out since last June, including, could you read what happens next in the cartoon? Well, just a sampling, a, a carefully curated sampling of, of of these copyrighted insults, and I and I'm loath to read them simply because I'm, I'm sure they're uh, I, they would it would invite a suit. But um, let's 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 get right into it. Lightweight embarrassment, choker, disaster, phony, hypocrite, dope, fraud, arrogant, loser, grubby, wacko, third rate, clown, dumb, clueless, nasty, failed, terrible, ridiculous, deceptive, weak, sad, crazy, totally corrupt, dumb as a rock, reckless, totally flawed, not nice, nervous, wrecked, zero talent, sloppy, a real nut job, blowhard, overrated, truly weird, a joke, unattracted, disgusting, irrelevant, spoiled. Oil brat, low class slob, goofball, atheist, hater, and racist, failing, fool, worthless, garbage, pure scum, crude, biased, kooky, awkward, dishonest, hopeless, dummy, liar, disgrace, basket case, disloyal, and really pathetic. And then he says, Stop being a total loser, a hu huge loser, use Trump brand insults and start winning today. <laughs> so, your thoughts today? 30 years. Well, well uh, <laughs> there, there are far more. Uh, um, uh, this was just a sampling. Um, but 30 years later, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I don't want to think beyond November. I hope I have no reason to think beyond November. I look forward to passing him on Fifth Avenue um, on, his, on his way to work uh, uh, on November 9th um, and without uh, incident and with him getting on with his life and the rest of the country getting on with its. How much have you interacted with him? He's got a lot of names no, for you. No, I've, I've observed him in, in the wild numerous occasions, most recently um, at the New Hampshire debates. He came out into the press area, and I could not take my eyes off the back of his head. It is something that photography just can't quite capture. 
it's like a panel of, of gossamer that has been lacquered onto the back of his, his head with a, a kind of golden um, uh, slurry. And um, I, I wanted to find the, the words or the imagery to share that with, with, uh, with my readers, but really drawing Trump is, is, is a journey. It's not a, a destination. You just have to keep after it. Has he ever threatened to sue you? No. Well, Gary Trudeau, I want to thank you for being with us. Gary Trudeau, creator of the comic strip Doonesbury, which appears daily in over, oh, 1,400 newspapers in 75. Gary Trudeau became the first comic strip artist ever to be awarded the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning, one of the most influential editorial cartoonists in decades. His new book is called Huge, 30 Years of Doonesbury on Trump. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report.